What's the deal with sin? Why do we trust the Bible? Asking for a friend. I walk with Jesus, but I still have questions sometimes. Will my doubt ever be too much for God? Isn't truth relative? Asking for a friend. Is the Bible outdated? Asking for a friend. Why do we believe that Jesus is the only way? I walk with Jesus, but I still have questions sometimes. Asking for a friend. Guys, I feel like you were forced to do that, okay? <laughs> well, hey, uh, my hope in spending time tonight is that uh, what, what we get to talk about uh, isn't just a blessing to you, but that it strengthens your faith. Uh, and I don't say that patronizingly. I don't say that. That sounds like such an old man pastor thing to say. Um, but I'm excited because these things have strengthened my faith. Um, and I'm excited to share them with you. But the place that we need to start is I need to um, play a song on a children's toy. This is a penny whistle. And if you guess what song this is, you win a prize. But you have already made me nervous, so if I mess it up, that is your fault. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> oh, yes, right there. Wrong. It's Lord of the Rings. That's right. In the Shire. Yeah. And you're like, what the heck does this have to do with it? Well, guess tonight we're going on a journey and we're going on a nerdy journey. Okay. That, that is what Lord of the Rings encapsulates. And already you're like, this guy's freaking weird. Um, and you're right. I, yes. But unequivocally, I can say this objectively. I don't even know you, but confidently, we are all weird. Um, and I may not mean that in the way that you mean that. I mean that actually in a very negative way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, li listen to this because this statement is weird. Um, you and I are actually generationally and historically weird as Christians in a negative way. What? Here, here's what I mean. Um, I think if, if you and I are honest, when we think about what is essential to our Christian faith and what is not, we would, we would, the things that make the list, we would say, uh, worship is absolutely essential. That's, it's very important. It's an opportunity for me to directly interact with God. It's experiential moments with him. It's a, it's a feeling that I share with him that's very important to my faith. But things that involve intellect, reason, logic, that's like, that's like what the Navy SEALs of Christians do. You know what I mean? That's, that's like what people who are paid to work at a church, that's, what they, that's, that's the heavy lifting stuff. Normal Christians aren't supposed to do that. That sounds nerdy and dry and boring. Um, and it is a very bizarre idea that we think, probably because this is the kind of Christianity that you and I have come into, we've kind of inherited it, but that is, I, I want you to hear me say this, that is not the way that Christians have thought for the majority of history. The way that we think, uh, this is, who said this? I don't know. It's probably uh, J.P. Moreland. He makes this list and he goes, um, for whatever reason, you and I, we separate religion and reason. Faith is on a different continent than facts. And Christianity has distance between it and critical thinking. And we accept that as just the objective way that the world works. But here's what's crazy, you guys. It has not always been that way, not just in perception, but in reality. Do you know that most of the Ivy League schools were founded by Christians as Christian institutions? I'm talking Rutgers, Dartmouth, Princeton, Yale. Did you know that? Because those people founding those schools, what they understood is that God can be glorified through my mind. And not just that he can, but that he should. And that if we can better understand the world around us, we can better understand the one who created it. And the trickle-down economics of that are that we will have a bigger awe for him, we will have a higher motivation to obey him, and our lives will be more satisfied, more fulfilled as we live in alignment with everything that he's called us to. But our culture, and most of us unwittingly in what we accept and how we live, walk every day almost rejecting that notion that most of Christians have not just accepted, but flourished under. And so I, I promise I won't spend a bunch of time in history, but I have to ask the question, like, well, then why are we different? Why are we weird? Where, where did this all go wrong? Um, and the answer is weird, and it has an asterisk next to it. The answer is um, the late 1880s, and this is just a piece of it. Um, I'm sorry, the late 1800s, 
revivalism in America was sweeping the nation. And, and a big characteristic of revival is that you guys are already bored. Nope. Oh, you're doing good? If you're doing good, say yee yee. Okay, deal. Well, a big characteristic of revivalism was that you had all these traveling itinerant preachers who were walking around, and they were amazing at, uh, or, with their oratory skills, and they, their re- rhetoric was incredibly compelling, and they were powerful and emotive, and they would preach the gospel, and people would be saved. Does any of that sound bad? No. This, this was incredible for the kingdom of God. The problem was, then they would pack up their tent, get up, and leave, and there was nothing left behind to help these people deepen their faith, to resolve their doubts, to even figure out what it looks like to be a critical thinker as a Christian in a way that glorifies God and blesses the people around me. And so people were entering the kingdom of God, but not getting past a weak faith. And that is kind of the foundation that was set that by derivative, you and I have inherited and kind of unknowingly accepted. But I don't want to just tell you about history and culture. I want to tell you about the kind of faith that God himself defines and invites us to. You guys are obviously in this series about apologetics. Do you know what the word apologetics means? Oh, good. You do great. Well, listen to this definition and see. Hopefully it's the same. Uh, This guy that I really respect, he is a brain on a stick pastor. His name is Vodi Bakum. And he, he defines apologetics this way. He would say, Apologetics is knowing what you believe, number one, why you believe it, number two, and how to communicate it to someone who needs it, number three. That's what apologetics is. And, and I've told you a bunch of stuff about people and from people, but I want to give you stuff from the Lord himself, okay? This is uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. And as I, I'm going to read a few of these verses about what God says about apologetics and the way that they fit in our faith. And I I just want you to listen with this lens. I want you to think about, do I connect with these verses? Do I relate to these verses? Do I value the weight that they're putting on these words? (laughs) Or does it feel like, hum, hum, hum? Because if I'm honest, if if I were to read this accurately based on the way that we, the majority of us live our Christian lives, it would read like this. This is Matthew 23, uh, verse 36 through 37. It says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? This sounds pretty important, by the way. This is Jesus talking about the most important thing. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Let's go to sleep. That's what we live. That's what we value. Okay, let's keep reading. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Who cares? With all your mind. Do you relate to this? Do you connect to this? Do you value this? What do, do you even have a working definition of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your mind? And I don't, I, this is, I'm getting worked up, but it doesn't sound very, I don't say that to be patronizing. I say that because I am passionate about the void that, we, that goes widely unaddressed for us as Christians, and it causes our faith to be weaker than God desires for us. Um, This is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. You probably have heard this before. When I was a little kid, I had my bunk beds with my little brother who would like talk in his sleep and wet the bed, and I was annoyed that we had to share a room. And my mom put on our wall this poster of all these fish going this way, and there was one fish going the other way, and it had this verse on it. It said, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you get renewed according to the Lord? I'm sorry, how do, you, how do you allow transformation to take place in you? It's by the renewing of your mind. And as a result, if you value this, if you, if you look for this to happen in your life, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You're freaking college students. You're young adults. Have you ever wanted desperately to know what God's will is? You, then you better value what it means to love the Lord your God with your mind. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, this, this one, um, I don't know, I start to get fired up. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Did any of that register, let alone, have you, do, we, do we actually do this? Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ? And then finally, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone 
who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. This means that God's purpose in inviting us to a well-rounded faith that includes apologetics is even bigger than meeting our needs, even bigger than giving us the strength that we need to get through this life. If we can value and implement apologetics in our faith, he will use us to do bigger things for his glory and for the blessing of other people around us. I don't know if you've ever got to that point in your Christian maturity where you said, I want to be effective for God in loving, hurting people around me. Well, if you have that desire, apologetics is a necessary piece of the puzzle. But that's not an association that we normally draw, you know what I mean? Um, and here's the thing, I want to talk uh, <laughs> real negatively now, and I'm, I do want to patronize you now. So please listen and grimace and think poorly of yourselves. Here we go. <clears throat> what happens to a person whose faith does not include loving God with our mind? I wrote this down so I wouldn't mess it up. We find ourselves living a life of comfort, convenience, and passivity. And none of us would sit here and say comfort, convenience, and passivity produces strong muscles. That's not how you do it. None of us would say a life of comfort, convenience, and passivity produces strong character. That's not how you do it. And in the same way, many of us are surprised when we approach this life looking for, contented in comfort, convenience, and passivity, and it does not produce a strong faith. I don't want to live a life where I'm riddled with unresolved doubt. I don't want to live a life where my desire to, to obey God and live out everything that he has for me is mediocre at best. And neither does God. And apologetics is an essential, not just tool, but remedy to that problem that we find ourselves in. And maybe you're here tonight and you find yourself going, uh-oh, that is my experience. Well, can I say that when as Christians we settle for passivity, we are opting not to be virtuous. When I choose passivity, I mean, let me, let me just give you some direct things. What I'm choosing, here's what that means, is that I'm going to allow the pastor to study the Bible for me. I'm going to allow the people on social media to live adventurous lives for me. I'm going to allow the news, which for you is TikTok, to decide decisions and think for me. And I'm just going to be a couch potato Christian. Guys, I don't, I don't say this to scold you. I say this to say, Good God, he has something so much better for you. He caused you to demolish arguments. He wants to take us with him as he raids hell. He wants to change eternities and, and grow us in the process as he makes us more into the image of his likeness, as he helps us conquer our own sin, as we find our identity and our security and our purpose and our value in him. That's what he wants to do. But in order to do it, you might have to have room in your theology to value loving, and to, I'm purposely saying this as dry and bland as it can sound, to value loving the Lord your God with all your mind because God values it. Isn't that a little bit convicting that I, I feel like I can say that with sweeping confidence? Most of us do not value loving the Lord with our mind. God wants us to. Um, so here's... Here's what I want to do um, with the rest of our time. I, I don't actually intend to do the apologetics for you because that would be just encouraging you to be a couch potato Christian continuing in your passivity, right? What I am going to do, and this is not a cop-out, what I am going to do is I want to show you um, my apologetics. I, I'm not up here claiming none of this can be refuted, but as I have studied, as I have tried to resolve my doubts, and as I have done what I think the Lord has asked me to do, these are the things that have strengthened my faith. And the reason I'm showing you this is not because I think I'm the great example. I'm showing you this because I don't think our responsibility um, is to know everything. I don't think you have a responsibility to know all the nuances of every single world religion, of all the tenets of every historical theologian who's ever spoken about. You know what I mean? That's not what you're responsible for. I th instead, I think what we're responsible, well, eh, responsible is the wrong word. Instead, I think what God invites us to in a robust, strong faith is as we bump into things that tempt us, as we trip over things that cause us to doubt, we don't just go, huh, that was bad for me, or huh, 
That's weird. I'll never know that answer. Instead, we stop and we exert effort and we apply ourselves to the resolution of that thing for his glory and for the strengthening of my faith. That is a part of the Christian walk, okay? Um, so here are my, uh, here's some of my things. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is um, these, these have been, in all the things that I've experienced, some of the most compelling reasons that I believe in the existence of God. And as I'm saying these, maybe you take notes, maybe you go, oh, me too. But maybe there's still holes there, and you go, that's not enough for my apologetics that will strengthen my faith and resolve my doubt. Then I, I hope this thing clicks in your brain where you go, oh, I, I have to do my own apologetics. That would be a way better outcome than just, you got cool Bible treats from Pastor TJ. You know what I mean? Okay, so here's the first one. Um, and <laughs> I have to preface this because as, as I, we talk about compelling arguments for the existence of God, um, what I'm about to share with you uh, will sound very childish, but I am immature, and these have been compelling to me, okay? And so what I need to tell you is that all of these are tenets or pieces of something called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Cosmos meaning universe. This basically is the study of the universe and the condition that we find it, right? Why is the universe this way, and what does, can we can we derive meaning out of the condition that it exists in? The cosmological argument for the existence of God points to this screaming idea that everything suggests there is a designer. And so to that end, um, <laughs> this is what Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. If that verse is true, and there is validity to a cosmological argument for the existence of God, then we should be able to look at the natural world around us and go, there's no flipping way that happened on accident. That, like, okay, an analogy that... Uh, my hero, Vody Bakken, gives us, he would say, if, we, if you and I were walking on the beach, not in a romantic way, just in a hanging out way, okay? We're walking on the beach, and you see a line in the sand. Neither of us would go, oh, God, what is that? Right? We probably wouldn't even notice it. And if we kept walking further, and you notice, like, a circle imprint on the sand, maybe if we're nerdy enough, we would stop and go, hmm, I wonder what caused that. Maybe a seashell fell just right here. And, uh, but if you and I were walking on the beach and we saw written into the sand, John loves Mary, we wouldn't go, what an incredible cosmic accident. This has no source or design. It would be self-evident, like, <laughs> somebody did that, right? Well, the argument in Romans 1 verse 20 and the argument of this apologetic is that the natural world is the same way. Here is one that is very compelling to me. Guys, I present to you your first item of evidence, the Wolverine frog. Did you know this exists? If you knew this exists, say, mm-hmm. Oh, okay. This is, I'm not making up this name. This is his real name. Do you know why they call that? Because I don't know if you can see under his armpit. No, no, go back. He has sideburns. That's like frog hair. Do you see that? That's incredible. Okay, now you can go to the next one. So if you can picture Wolverine, you know he has those mutton chops, right? We're one for one so far. All right, now go to the x-ray. What this frog does is a self-defense a mechanism is he takes his little froggy fingers, and when there's an attacker coming to him, he presses down on him, and he breaks all the top knuckles in his froggy fingers, turning them into shards of bone that then protrude through his froggy flesh, and he scratches the eyes out of his attacker. And there's so much like weird bacteria on that point of incision through his skin that when he scratches your eyes out, they like swell up, puss up, and fall out. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, I know. It's real gross. But I'm just telling you, I look at that, and in my, in my child brain, I go, that is too cool for that to have happened on accident. There is no freaking way that an X-Men frog exists because atoms collided and then millions of years and then, ah, like, no way. If I was God, I would, <laughs> and I had the self-discipline to make this and hide it in the rainforest, I would be, like, refreshing my screen every day. Did they find it yet? Did they find it yet? <laughs> Did they find it yet? Oh, man, I hope they find this when the X-Men movies get released. Woo! Like, I'm just saying. Okay. 
Uh, can I give you another one? Yeah. Hey, okay, here we go. Uh, guys, this next example that is very important. Actually, don't do it yet. Um, can we be nerdy on this for a second? Okay, the idea here isn't just, oh, that's cool, it's not an accident. The idea within the cosmological argument for the existence of God, well, I don't know. Guys, I'm not a professor, okay? I'm just reading stuff. Um, <laughs> is that things like awesomeness, things like beauty, they really do empirically suggest a designer. Because you can't explain them away with some benign purpose or some, like, functionality. that Like, there's a million other ways that frog could have defended himself besides breaking his fingers and slashing the eyes out of his attacker. Do you know what I mean? Let me, let me develop this idea further. Have you, in my opinion, the most beautiful smell in the entire world is when uh, an orange tree's blossoms start to blossom. Have you smelled that smell? Like in spring, some of you guys are like, oh, that's my clothing detergent. No, wrong. I mean, in, I mean, real life, you couch potato Christians. Okay. <laughs> we had this tree when I lived in Fallbrook, and I would walk outside, and I would purposely stay there longer. And I'm not like a, like a, I don't know, a romantic, like, enjoy the moment kind of guy. But even as like this dry Ram Ramona hillbilly, I was like, this is beautiful, you know? <laughs> and I, I, even, I was even so compelled, I was like, I got to look this up. Why is this this way? And so I Googled, can bees smell? Because <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> Not only can they smell, they can smell 100 times better than people. And that actually did not help my argument because now you have a functionality and it's like, okay, well, that is beautiful, but now you've got this symbiosis and a relationship between two species that as they've, you know, progressed and, and complicated themselves, evolved or, or whatever, that now there's a mutual recip reciprocity. The tree gets pollinated, the bee gets food. Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Done. But why does it smell good to me? I'm not out there in a black and yellow Halloween costume like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, that makes sense that it smells good to the bee, but why does it have to exist in that way? Why do I find it in that condition that the smell is so amazing to me? And then my brain first went, okay, well, maybe it's because the tree wants me to eat the oranges, and then I'm going to eat them and <laughs> poop them out and plant the seeds by doing that, you know? I don't know. But do you know, do you know, from the bud of an orange blossom to a time, the time that an orange is edible, do you know how much time elapses between those two points? Seven to 15 months. That's not the purpose of the smell. You can't explain that away by functionality. There is something that exists in the nature of the orange tree, orange tree that is not functional. It is beautiful and the scientific community does not have an answer for this. It's as if there's a God who, as Scripture says, that every good and perfect gift is from above, that he lavishes his love on us. And it's not just in what Jesus did in the cross. In everyday little mundane things, you and I experience the love of Jesus in the beauty of nature, and it proves God is good and he loves you. And that the Bible's understanding of reality is legitimated over and over again in little things like this when they when empirical science things are not. And even in this, I want to be careful. I do not want to pit science against religion because so much of the initial implementation of things like the scientific method were through college universities looking to better understand and glorify their God, right? Um, okay. There's so many of these. I'm just, what about tri-tip, huh? Why do I have taste buds? Have you thought about that? Can we, I don't know, am I born? Can we do another one? Yes. Okay. Uh, so listen. <laughs> I've tried to talk myself out of this one too, okay? <sighs> but like I tried to explain away taste buds. It's like, no, no, no. That works in, a, in an atheist world. That works w it, without the necessity of God uh, because maybe my taste buds exist so that I will be biologically attracted to foods that will supply all the necessary nurse, nutrients, v minerals, vitamins. You know what I'm saying? But it, that doesn't work because no little kid likes eating their vegetables. And the stuff that tastes the best will kill you. Do you right? You guys like hot Cheetos. You, you for sure, like <laughs> two decades off your life. I'm just saying. <laughs> no. I mean, you could put sugar in poison and it tastes good and you die. There is no correlative functionality that allows taste buds to be explained away without this concept 
of beauty coming from a transcendent being. Are you getting what I'm saying? I don't want to belabor it, but I, I, I feel very strongly about this, all right? Okay, let me give you another animal. And guys, I drew this one so that you would have a reference point and be able to picture it in your mind's eye. Here we go. This is the bombardier beetle, okay? <laughs> have it, raise your hand if you've heard of the bombardier beetle. Oh, you have? You smart guys. All right. Um, guys, this freaking thing is incredible. Go to the next picture and we'll show you what it actually looks like. There he is. Now, they did this like rendering thing where they, they I don't know, Photoshop peeled off the back of it to show you these two glands that it has. Because the bombardier beetle has a flamethrower on his butt. And he has, these, he has these two glands that each hold different chemicals. And they secrete them through this like organ protrusion off the back of his arm, whether it's thorax, whatever, booty cheeks. And what, <laughs> they, like, they come out at the exact right distance where it causes a chemical reaction that becomes a chemical fire at a temperature of 220 degrees. So it's now boiling acid, but it's far enough that it doesn't singe his little beetle booty, you know what I mean? Not only that, this thing on the back swivels 360 degrees. It's a turret. Not only that, he, he can pulse the, the chemical acid fire coming out of this at a rate of 500 pulses a second. This, this little guy, a big animal tries to get him, and he goes, ah, ha, 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 ha. Guys, I have spent hours on YouTube Googling bombardier beetle tarantula, bombardier beetle praying mantis. I did that today. Uh, bombardier beetle frog. Can I show you a, a still shot of this, a frog trying to eat one of these and his tongue swollen and burnt? Yeah. Is that incredible? Are there any more on the beetle? I think that's the last one, right? Oh, yeah, that's the smoke coming out of his butt flamethrower. I'm just saying. <laughs> But again, I want to take this a level deeper. This isn't just awesome things must come from a God. This, this thing actually also pre presents another tenet of the cosmological argument for the existence of God, which is the concept of irreducible complexity. This idea suggests that you cannot remove one part, meaning that this thing can't progress from simpler, uh, less organs, less molecules, and then over time become more complex progressively to arrive at the version that we see now, because in doing so, it would undo itself. Meaning, right, that thought process would tell you that, well, the, the membranes lining these two chemical sacs would have to be uh, thick enough and placed in the abdomen just right so that they, they don't touch, the chemicals can't combine, and blow up his little body, right? Well, over time, what if they weren't th thick enough as he's progressing and he just explodes on his insides? Well, then there's no more of these guys, right? The idea of irreducible complexity suggests in a very compelling way there must be a designer making these flipping cool little things. All right, next one. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, this is the last thing I'll say on this um, in terms of the existence of God. And I, I told you this before. I am not giving you all of the exhaustive, compelling evidence for why a God exists. I'm giving you the things that have stuck with me in my weird brain. If these don't do it for you, you should go out and find them. Okay? Um, the last thing on this one is consider the alternative. I don't know if you've thought about this, um, but a lot of times, especially in our science classes, we talk about the nature of things. We don't talk about the origin of things. Even in Darwin's book, uh, Origin of Species, he doesn't actually address the origin. Is that weird to you? That is, that is weird to me. And what I'm saying is, um, oh, there's so much here. I'm, I am actively editing right now. Um, okay. There are, there are two renowned, alive, leading scientists, like prolific authors, speaking tours, probably get paid bajillions of dollars every time they show up on a college campus to do a keynote session. Uh, one whose name is Richard Dawkins. Have you ever heard of this guy? Yeah. Not a real big fan of the God of the Bible. In fact, you wrote, yeah, anyway. Um, he, when asked, where do you think all life originated from? Rather than say, hey, it looks like uh, God. He went, I, I believe Aliens probably came down and seeded Earth with the building blocks of life. That is, that is a quote. Renowned in his field today. Like, like that is a primary alternative to theology. Okay? Let me give you another guy. There's a guy named Dr. Michael Ruse. These guys are 
doctorates, by the way. Um, he is currently a professor at Florida State University, and he's not just a professor of the philosophy of biology class, uh, which is a graduate level class. He writes collegiate level textbooks about not just biology, the philosophy of biology, the way you should think about science. Now this is getting weird, right? I would argue that most of the time when we interact with science, we're not interacting with science. We're interacting with scientism. The belief that only things can only be true if they're proven through what you can see, touch, taste, smell, or experience. I can't see your brain. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? I'm just saying. Um, anyway, Michael Ruse, when asked, where do you think all life came from? He said, and it sounds very smart. He said, I believe inorganic crystalline structures piggybacked on one another, creating the first organic molecule. Holy cow, dude, you got a PhD. That is fantastic. Can I give you an example of an inorganic crystalline structure? <gasps> the table salt. What this man is saying is that one piece of table salt or the equivalent said, hey, buddy, hop on. And he went, woohoo. And that's where life came from, just like the boy Pinocchio. What? You believe that over the idea, hey, that looks made. There must be someone who made it. Maybe God. You crazy man. That takes way more faith than the stuff that I'm into. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that is crazy, which takes us back to what we were talking about initially. It's not, well, let me, let me look at my list to make sure I'm not saying this. Um, that, note, that page fell off. Whatever. Ah, I found it. Um, Religion versus reason, right? Faith versus facts. Christianity versus crit critical thinking. No. It's philosophy versus philosophy. It's worldview to worldview. The idea of a God, scientism, naturalism, what have you, that's not the scientific method of science, period. And any philosophy of biology you add around it is now you're reading the world through the lens of your worldview. I don't know if that's too nerdy for you. Let's continue. <clears throat> what is that? Oh, this is a cool background. I like it. Um, <laughs> cool. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Here we go. Um, I want to shift now to, uh, this will just be the only other part um, that I share with you because everything else is off limits. Um, I'm a very private man. Why I believe the Bible is true. Can we do that one? Yes? Okay, deal. Um, this first one in here is if we did the cosmological argument for the existence of God, I want to talk about the ontological argument for the existence of God. This one feels weird a little bit. On, the ontological argument existence for God uh, covers what is existence? What is? And you're like, finish your sentence. No, 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 that's it. Like, how, how can we, how do we even talk about existence? What does exist? I don't mean trees. I mean like, do my thoughts exist? And how, can I, how do I talk about this? Can I prove that? Do, do feelings that I carry of guilt or insecurity or emptiness, does exist, right? And is, is there a method to prove that, measure that, talk about that? And where do those things come from? How do you explain those, especially if not from a God? And I've, I gave you the negative ones, but even feelings of purpose or value or love, right? Um, and the, the first one here I give you is my experience. This is actually the reason I'm a Christian. And this one's ironic to me because I would never listen to someone else who says, I know God's real because of my experience. That sounds so thin, right? Um, but let me just tell you what I mean. And there is more, okay? Um, this verse is the reason that I'm a Christian. I didn't want to be a Christian uh, in school. I tried every way to do mental gymnastics to not have there be a God because then I wouldn't have to do what he says. I wouldn't have to sacrifice my will to his. Anything that looked fun, I could do it. Done. But this verse smashed me. Ecclesiastes 2, 10 through 11, it says, I denied myself nothing uh, my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. What my experience put in my face over and over and over again was the lies that friends, TV, promotions, whatever were selling me. They're like, oh, man, if you can just date this person, you, 
your life is set, right? If you, can, if you can have a relationship with the right kind of person, you'll be elated and it's going to be awesome. Or feel this, smoke this, experience this in high school, right? If you can get to that party, get a red solo cup in your hand, be talking to a hot person of the opposite gender and get smashed with everybody else, dude, you are living the highest and best version of life possible. But every single one perpetually, I would get to that party. Everyone's drunk in 10 minutes, and this person's throwing up. This person's slurring their speech. Those two are fighting, and no one's going to remember it tomorrow. Meaningless, meaningless. And I exerted myself. I showed up. I spent the time, and I am empty and hollow. This was a lie. And the only thing that lined up with what my experience was perpetually from per- from things that you could experience to satisfy you, from things you could accomplish to satisfy you, from things you could feel to satisfy you. Hollow, hollow, meaningless, meaningless. The only thing that was saying true things to my experience was the Bible. And I don't want to make this a concept. I want to make this real. Um, One of the things for me in high school was, you know, people would say over and over again, like, hey, porn's fine. It's innocuous. You're not hurting anybody. People have urges, whatever. Um, and it was an issue for me. And the, thing, the, the things that people said, like, yeah, that's fine. That's not going to mess you up, whatever. Lies. Here's what the Bible said that lined up with my experience. Flee from sexual immorality. This is 1 Corinthians 6.18. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. While this was an issue for me, my self-esteem was tanking. I had friendships with girls that I respected and enjoyed, and now I am objectifying ladies, and I can't even make eye contact with them, let alone the conversations that we used to enjoy. Like, I'm becoming more insecure. This is totally a sin that I am committing against my own body. The world has lies. The Bible has truth. In my experience, I'm seeing this is the only source of what's true. Does that make sense? Okay, let's get into the nerd stuff. Can we do some Indiana Jones stuff? Okay, here we go. I'm going to fly through these. Um, All right, the truth of uh, archaeology proving the Bible. And what I want to give you is just a couple of these. I'm going to start talking faster. We might not have time to do all of them. Um, But I don't just want to show you archaeology that proves the Bible. I want to show you archaeology that caused the Bible to be mocked until these were found. Like these things silenced the critics of the Bible, okay? The first one is... Laish. Um, You can go and throw up that first picture. Yep. I'm going to read you a verse that will confuse you, but you need no context because the context doesn't matter. Here's what it says. I know. There's no other time I would ever say that. Um, Here comes the heresy. Genesis 14, 14. It says, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. This is a story where Abram's nephew Lot Uh, is captured by the Canaanites and taken to their stronghold, this place called Dan. People mocked the Bible for this because at the time Abram was alive, there was no place called Dan. Dan wouldn't come to exist for something like 3,700 years later. And what they found, archaeology, was this stuff. Dan was was pagan. Dan was a a Canaanite city, okay? The architecture of the archaeology they found in this place, this is where this says is going to be, was... Israeli from the time. Those are called Solomonic gates, right? Solomon, King Solomon, Israel, that kind of stuff. So it's the wrong timeline. It's the wrong people. Bible screwed up, it like irreconcilably not true. But what they found, let me, let me check the date. Um, what they found, uh, oh, great, I didn't even put the date in here. Um, I, I took this picture. 50 yards away, they found another archaeological site. Go ahead and show that picture with the right archaeology, dating to the right time. And this place was called Laish. And if you look, you can see like these little uh, engravings of these like men with long beards. Like if you picture Nebuchadnezzar, the way he's portrayed, the little hats like the monkey in Aladdin wore, you know. It's all the right motif, building supplies, dating, like all the right stuff, which means at the time it was written, there was a place called Dan. So the writer was saying, hey, yeah, all this stuff happened at Dan because he was referring to his reference point. But everyone then knew, well, back then it was Laish. So what caused the Bible to be mocked actually proved its validity with time and what was found in the ground. Let's do another one. Um, Have you ever heard of Mary Magdalene? Jesus' close friend, right? All these things. She is a huge reason that the Bible has received a ton of scrutiny over time because there are no other historical, not just accounts of her, 
But Mary Magdalene, names like that, your last name was like where you were from. So in our language, it would actually be Mary of Magdala. There is no town by Capernaum where Jesus was called Magdala in historical record. How do we, no, this is, this is bogus. She's just a made-up person from a made-up town. Not true. Until 2009, don't show, oh, you did. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 2009, this guy goes to build a gas station on a lot that he built, and they start digging, and they find these small mosaic tiles. And he's so bummed because now it's a protected archaeological site, and he's not going to make money on gas. <laughs> but what they had found was the, this incredibly intricate floor to a synagogue, and it had subscriptions on an altar in there naming the place Magdala. And it was between, do you guys know the name of the mountain that Jesus would go up on to pray? Mount Arbel? And Capernaum, the town that he lived in for much of his three years of ministry, right between those two was this little town called Magdala. What once brought the Bible mockery now proved its validity over and over and over again. Can we do another one? Yeah. Okay, have you ever heard of Herod? Yeah, he was involved in the death of Jesus. The Bible was mocked for this guy. They couldn't find any historical accounts from him outside the Bible. They're like, lame, not true. Well... Uh, I have walked, because what has now been discovered, I have walked in the cave city called Moresha that he grew up in. It was this system of caves. You can go, uh, yeah, that one. The system of caves, and they, they were known by, this town is mentioned all over the place. The queen of Egypt at the time referenced them because she loved buying olive oil from them because above ground they had all their olive trees and then they would bring them underground, and in the cool of the caves, they would immediately cold press the olive oil, and they made it the best in the known world. We have the cave city he grew up in, and we also have one of his mountaintop palaces. Go ahead and show that picture. This is called Masada. Inscriptions, archaeology, architecture, all of it validating everything the Bible says. Um, there's another one. We, we won't have time for this. If you want to talk about it after, we can. You've probably heard of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, yes? Probably, yeah. Um, you can show that picture of that one if you want. Little Bedouin shepherd boys were throwing rocks up into a cave until they heard a crash of some clay jars. And what they found absolutely substantiated everything that the Bible was. And the, the claims against it at that time, I think this was 1946, um, were... Like within the doctrine of Mormonism, I think it's the eighth article of faith. It says they, they believe faith documents so far as they can prove the validity of their translation. And they didn't believe the translation of the Bible. That was why one of the reasons the Book of Mormon was needed to be written. Well, now with Qumran, the huge problem presented is, okay, but now we have documents from 700 AD. And now we have documents from 4500 B.C., and all of them are the exact same with a 95% accuracy. And the only difference is, is the way the spelling of words has changed from generation to generation, which is not accuracy issues. So the claim that this book has been corrupted or diluted or changed over time completely refuted the validity of this book stance. And so here's what I want to close with. If we can arrive at a point where we believe God exists... And we know why. I know what I believe about God, and I know why I believe it. And we can arrive at a point where we believe that what the Bible says is true. I know that I believe it's true, and I know why I believe it's true. Then what both of those things give me in God's grace is it allows me to have an apologetic about myself. Now I can accurately discern what I should believe about myself. What is the source that determines my apologetic about me? Is it culture that says you'll never be attractive enough, you'll never be smart enough, you'll never be impressive enough, you'll never be accomplished enough, keep going, keep try this, keep lies, 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 bye, 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 and end up hollow and empty? Is it your own self-talk, which you probably know how dangerous that is, just the negativity and the criticism and the guilt that we heap on ourselves over and over again? Or do these two things being true set us up in God's abundant grace to now have an apologetic of ourselves that I have value? Because God made me in the image of him. That I have worth, that I am loved, that I have purpose. And that in his love, I have everything that I need. Now, those things, they're not just stale Christianese phrases. 
they're really true. And they come with all the weight of being true. This is the last sentence I want to read you. There is a God who exists, who gave us his word, and who loves you more than you can fathom. And it's absolutely crazy that that sentence is true. But it is. Let's pray. God, we love you. And tonight we we just want you to receive glory from what we know. God, would you get glory from the strength of our faith? Would you get glory even from doubt, but as we work to resolve doubt and as we accept your invitation to have a strong faith that includes knowing why we believe what we believe. God, thank you that you did not call us to a blind faith. And thank you for loving us first. In Christ's name we pray, amen.